Hi, welcome to our Jubilee online service. My name's Jo, this is Lex, and we are part of the Eldership team here at Jubilee. Yeah, Joe and I lead the uh, the team that's based in, in Clough Street, in gardens, in the city centre, and we're loving being back together again. But for those of you who are joining us today online, we trust that you'll be edified and strengthened and that this time of worship will really help you direct your heart to God. Turn 
trust you were able to connect with God during that special time of worship. And now, this. Welcome back to Jubilee Kids News. Guys, we've been able to go back into the church buildings over the past couple of weeks, and we've seen some amazing artwork from the kids who've been able to attend. Have a look. While these kids were doing some amazing artwork, the kids Nathan was in charge of decided to throw things. Have a look. Two, one, go! <laughs> wait, wait, wait! I got it, I got it! Oh! Man, I love my job! Guys, we know it's still a very confusing time where we're back but not fully back yet. The building's open, but we can't all go back yet, so we're still committed to amazing online videos to make sure you get to experience amazing lessons. And amidst all this uncertainty, the kids team has decided to start a new series on something we know with absolute certainty. Make sure you tune in. Well, from all of us here at Jubilee Kids News, I've been Nathan, and that's been Skippy. You've been you, and most true of all, Jesus loves you. Thanks, Nathan. Thanks, Nathan, so much for that. And, of course, Skippy and Nathan, the ultimate skipster. Um, Catherine and the rest of the team, you guys have just served us so well through, through such a long period of time with great resources yeah. for our kids. We're Thank so you. We so appreciate it. Thank you, team. 
and both Jubilee venues are meeting in person again yeah. and we comply totally both venues comply totally with all the safety regulations which means you'll have to get a ticket for each of the three services available so you just need to go to the Quicket website search for Jubilee um, and then the three services will come up and just click on the service that you want to attend and then you'll also notice that um, all the two morning services have children's ministries and all the details of the different age groups will be there so you need to click on yep. and get a ticket for your children too wonderful and two upcoming events next sunday in person we have a special guest speaker lara buchanan from the ravi zacharias trust in the uk lara is a, a sought after featured speaker uh, with the trust and she grew up in yeah, Jubilee. Uh, we love her. We do. And she actually even babysat yeah. our kids, lived just around the corner from us over here. And uh, it's going to be wonderful to welcome Lara in person, all three of those services. A great opportunity to bring some friends as well yeah, who, who may not understand fully the gospel or want to find out more about Christianity. And then uh, also coming up November the 7th, a Saturday morning, again in person. I'm sure we'll provide some kind of Zoom option for those who are unable to join us, but a leadership summit for anyone who's in leadership at Jubilee, whatever area of leadership you're in, you're welcome to join us on that morning. And that's from 10 to 11.15 on the 7th of November. It is indeed. And now, my favourite time of year... <laughs> yes, it's nearly Christmas. <laughs> it isn't. It is. Well, it I'm is. starting the cat now because I love Christmas. But every year we have asked you, uh, Jubilee to um, just put together some shoe boxes full of goodies and Christmas presents for our... <laughs> you are putting me off. <laughs> but so the Christmas presents for our Kids Club and Sunshade team. So we have got an amazing video that Diana Peterson has put together with all the information on how you can be involved in this amazing thing that blesses actually loads of kids in Jubilee. Take it away, Diane. Hello Jubilee, my name is Diana Peterson. And even though it's only October, we need to start planning for Christmas. This year at Christmas, we wanna bless children in our church through the Sunshade and Kids Club Ministries by creating shoebox style Christmas presents, just like we did last year. If you're interested in being involved, the first step is to email me. Once you've done that, I will send a details of a child in our church through to you, and then you can get on to step two, shopping for your child. You'll need a shoebox size box that you can decorate and fill with lots of goodies. There's some suggested items on our website. And um, once it's filled, then you're ready to drop it off. And that's step three. I'm really excited about partnering with you this year for the Christmas shoebox project. My hope is that everybody in Jubilee will be involved in this project through prayer. I hope that we can be a community that prays for each other and especially for our children. Don't forget to email me. So I think I might just keep my hat on until every name on Diana's list has been filled up and knowing that they're going to get a shoebox this Christmas. No! Or maybe not. But, but please, we, uh, we just say, please just uh, contact Diana so that you can fill up a, a shoebox and bless a child yeah, this Christmas. Yeah, thanks, Diana, for that. And uh, we've got the pleasure now of hearing Carl is continuing our series in Isaiah. Over to Kyle. Welcome uh, to Jubilee Online. It's great to see you if you're part of the Jubilee family. Thank you for joining us. If you're new to Jubilee or if you're visiting us online, my name is Kyle. I'm one of the pastors here. And it is a huge joy and privilege for me to continue our sermon series in the book of Isaiah. We've entitled this sermon series Portraits of Christ. And what it's about is taking a look at the different prophecies about Jesus that we see in the book of Isaiah. Uh, today, we are gonna consider a prophecy that portrays Jesus as this majestic king. So if you have a Bible, won't you open it up to the book of Isaiah? Our reading will come from chapter 11. But before we turn to chapter 11, I wanna look at chapter seven with you briefly because it helps us get a sense of the context into which this prophecy is given. The context is a time and a place when kings are at war with each other. Israel's king, King Ahaz, 
is under pressure from other kings, kings of other nations. Uh, he's feeling the pressure of these different nations, and he is tempted to find a solution to that pressure through political alliances. And into that context, God speaks to Ahaz, because Ahaz is God's king. He's the king of God's people, the nation of Judah. And God tries to give assurance to Ahaz. Rather than seeking a political solution, he calls Ahaz to trust in him. So if you have a Bible, just open it up to Isaiah chapter 7, and we'll begin in verse 1. When Ahaz, son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, was king of Judah, King Rezin of Aram and Pekah, son of Ramalia, king of Israel, marched up to fight against Jerusalem, but they could not overpower it. Now the house of David was told, Aram has allied itself with Ephraim, so the hearts of Ahaz and his people were shaken, as the trees of the forest are shaken by the wind. So what you've got is two kings, the king of Aram and the king of Israel, or Ephraim, allying themselves against the king of Judah, Ahaz. And Judah is very scared. We're told that their uh, hearts were shaken as the trees of the forest are shaken by the wind. It's a description of the fear and anxiety gripping the nation of Judah. But God comes to Ahaz through his prophet Isaiah and gives Ahaz a comforting message. He essentially says to Ahaz, keep calm, you'll be okay. Don't be scared. Take a look with me at verse 4. The message to Ahaz was, be careful, keep calm, and don't be afraid. Do not lose heart because of these two smoldering stubs of firewood. God says to Ahaz, don't be worried about these two nations, Aram and Ephraim. They're not going to bother you in the end. In fact, in just a few years' time, God says, these two nations will be destroyed, and they'll be destroyed by another nation, a superpower, the nation of Assyria. But God says to Ahaz, be firm in your faith, verse 9. If you do not stand firm in your faith, you will not stand at all. God is trying to give assurance to Ahaz. Don't fear these other kings. Rather, trust in the Lord. I'll keep you safe. And then in a wonderful act of generosity, God, knowing Ahaz's fear, gives Ahaz the option of additional assurance. He says in verse 10, again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, ask the Lord your God for a sign, whether in the deepest depths or in the highest heights. God says to Ahaz, listen, you're going to be okay. Ask me for a sign, any sign you want, a sign in the, of, uh, in the deep or in the heavens, ask me for a sign. And here we see Ahaz's ungodly response. He says, I will not ask for a sign. I will not put the Lord to the test. Pretending to be pious, what Ahaz is actually doing is refusing to believe. He's refusing to believe God's promise. He's refusing to take God at his word. And as a result, God actually says to him, Ahaz, you are no longer fit to be king of my people. And God goes on to say in the chapters to follow, he is going to reject Ahaz as the king of his people. And he's going to actually send the nation of Assyria, not just to judge these other nations, but to judge Judah as well. And it will be like um, the tree of Judah that is represented by Ahaz is going to be cut down. Because of Ahaz's unbelief, he's no longer fit to be king of God's people. And God promises to judge him. But as the prophecies unfold, God also promises one day to replace him. That out of this stump, uh, out of this broken tree that's been cut down, a new branch will emerge, a new king will arise. And it's that prophecy that Lex spoke about last week and that we will see again this week in Isaiah chapter 11. So if you have a Bible... Why don't you please open it up to Isaiah chapter 11, where we see this wonderful promise of God's new king. Isaiah chapter 11. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of might 
the spirit of the knowledge and fear of the Lord, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears, but with righteousness he will judge the needy. With justice he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. With the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt and faithfulness the sash round his waist. The wolf will live with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the goat. The calf and the lion and the yearling together and a little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear. Their young will lie down together and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play near the cobra's den and the young child will put its hand into the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. In that day, the root of Jesse will stand as a banner for the peoples. The nations will rally to him, and his resting place will be glorious. In that day, the Lord will reach out his hand a second time, to reclaim the surviving remnant of his people from Assyria, from Lower Egypt, from Upper Egypt, from Cush, from Elam, from Babylonia, from Hamath, and from the islands of the Mediterranean. He will raise a banner for the nations and gather the exiles of Israel. He will assemble the scattered people of Judah from the four quarters of the earth. Ephraim's jealousy will vanish and Judah's enemies will be destroyed. Ephraim will not be jealous of Judah, nor Judah hostile towards Ephraim. They will swoop down on the slopes of Philistia to the west. Together they will plunder the people to the east. They will subdue Edom and Moab, and the Ammonites will be subject to them. The Lord will dry up the gulf of the Egyptian sea. With a scorching wind, he will sweep his hand over the river Euphrates. He will break it up into seven streams so that anyone can cross over in sandals. There will be a highway for the remnant of his people that is left from Assyria as there was for Israel when they came up from Egypt. Let's pray as we consider this passage together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful promise of a perfect king, a king who is perfect in who he is and a king who is wonderful in all that he does. We pray as a result of studying Isaiah 11, that our hope in this king, that our love for this king, and that our commitment to this king would deepen. Amen. Well, it's a wonderful passage, Isaiah 11. Some of the most remarkable and beautiful poetry we'll ever come across. And there's a huge challenge in trying to explain this poetry because poetry uh, is meant to be delighted in. And sometimes when you try to explain it, um, you can make it sound dull and lifeless. And so I'm going to do my best, but I do want to commend this passage to you for your reflection and your meditation. Poetry is meant to be absorbed deep into our hearts and minds. And so although I'm going to try and explain this passage, I do want to commend it to you for your deeper reflection and meditation. It's a beautiful passage. It's a prophecy uh, that describes this king, this wonderful king that is going to come. And it speaks of two big things of this king. It tells us who this king is, and it tells us what this king does, who he is and what he does. So firstly, let's consider who this king is. Who is this promised king? that God is going to send. Well, the first thing we see about this promised king, the first thing about who he is, is that he is endowed with the Spirit. Take a look again at verse 2. The Spirit of the Lord will rest on this king, the Spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the Spirit of counsel and of might, the Spirit of the knowledge and the fear of the Lord. This king, like a lot of characters in the Old Testament, has received the Spirit, But unlike many characters, he doesn't receive the spirits in a temporary way or in a partial way. No, he receives the spirits in a permanent way and in a full way. The spirit comes upon him and it's emphasized four times. We're told that the spirit of the Lord is going to come upon this king. 
And notice the kind of work that the Spirit will enable him to do. The Spirit will give him wisdom and understanding. That is, the Spirit will enable him to govern. To have wisdom and understanding in the Old Testament is to have the knowledge to govern the nation. But the Spirit, more than just governance, the Spirit gives him the ability to wage war. It's the Spirit of counsel and of might, which is to say this is the Spirit that gives you military strength and strategy. But more than that, it's the spirit of the knowledge and the fear of the Lord. It's a spirit of genuine godliness and piety. It's the spirit of true spirituality, a sensitive heart towards God. This picture is of the perfect king. He is wise to govern. He is courageous in war. And he is sensitive to God. This promised king is the ultimate king. He's got an enlightened mind. He has undaunted courage and he has a sanctified heart. He is a king like no other. In fact, if you consider the great kings of history, none of them match this description. There are some kings, if you go back in history, who certainly had the ability to govern. They were fantastic governors. They were able to manage a nation. Other kings were brilliant in their military strength. Whilst others maybe did have more of a sensitive uh, spirituality and a heart for God, and yet we never find a king that can bring all of these qualities together. Some of the most effective kings were some of the most brutal, and sometimes the kings who did have a more sensitive conscience were unable to really build a great empire. This king, however, brings all of these things together. He is the ultimate king. He is the king we've always wanted. He's the king we need. Charles Simeon, speaking of this king, says, He knew on all occasions how to vary his conduct so as ultimately to answer best the purposes of his mission. And so nice was his discernment, so unsearchable his skill, that whether he denounced judgments or proclaimed mercy, whether he maintained silence or witnessed a good confession, He invariably combined majesty with meekness and fidelity with love. It's rare to find these qualities combined in a human. Strength with wisdom, godliness and piety uh, with courage. And yet in Christ, we see a king who has all of these things. The perfect king, majestic in power, gentle in his care for the weak and the needy, This is the king that God is going to send. This is the king better than King Ahaz, better even than great King David. This is the king that God will send. And notice this king at the end of verse 3, sorry, the beginning of verse 3, he will delight in the fear of the Lord. This is a king who delights, not in power, not in wealth, but in God. A king who delights in knowing who God is. That's the first aspect of this promised king. He is a king who is filled with the Spirit of God, endowed with the Spirit of God, enabled to serve and govern because of the Spirit of God. But secondly, the promised king isn't just filled with the Spirit. The promised king is righteous and faithful. Take a look with me again at verse 3. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears, but with righteousness he will judge the needy. With justice, he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. With the breath of his lips, he will slay the wicked. In other words, he is a king of discernment. He will not judge things just by their appearances. He doesn't just judge based on what he sees and he hears at the surface. No, this king, when he comes to exercise his judgment, is able to see below the surface. He's able to see deeper and hear more than normal kings can. And that enables him, of course, to make the right judgment. It enables him to make just decisions. On that great day of judgment, when this king will judge the living and the dead, his judgment will be just. His judgments will be true. There will be nothing he does not see. There will be no fact he overlooks. He is the perfect judge because he sees more deeply And he hears more clearly than any other judge in history. He is exactly the kind of king you want to be judging. 
because he is righteous and faithful in all that he does. Notice also the instrumentality of his judgment. How does he judge? He judges with his word. Take a look at verse 4 again. He strikes the earth with the rod of his mouth, with the breath of his lips. He slays the wicked. In other words, he judges through his word. The instrument of his judgment is the word of his verdict. He is able to judge and save. He is able to make and enforce decisions through his word. So powerful is this king. He says it and it's done. Just as God created the world through a word, so God can judge the world through his word. He judges and he saves through his word. Finally, in addition to noticing his words, notice his clothes as well. Verse 5, righteousness will be his belt and faithfulness the sash around his waist. Uh, Just as today, often clothes give you a, a picture in some way, sometimes an indication, an expression of who someone is. Their clothes tend to reveal maybe something of their character. Uh, I'm not sure what uh, my bland white t-shirt says about me, but uh, nevertheless, uh, your clothes do tend to reveal something of, of what you're like. And in this case, his clothes highlight who he is. He wears righteousness and faithfulness. There's so much a part of his character. There's so much a part of who he is that they constitute his very clothing. In other words, Isaiah says, God is going to send us a king who is perfect in every way, the king we've always wanted, the king we've always needed, the king who will judge the earth with righteousness and the peoples with equity. There will be no injustice. There will be no wrongdoing that that, um, people get away with because we're going to have a perfect king who can govern the earth in righteousness and justice. It's worth reflecting on just how significant this is. Although we don't live in a day and an age where we have kings, even in democratic economies and nations, we're deeply invested in who leads us. If the political situation in South Africa, or for that case, America, as the American elections loom, are anything to go by, we see all the more clearly just how invested people are in making sure they have the leader they want. Right? We, may, we may have a democracy uh, kind of in, in, a, in many countries in the world, but people are still deeply invested in who, who their leader is. And how wonderful to look at this prophecy, to look at this portrait of Christ, and to realize that in him we have the perfect king. We have the perfect leader. If you look at this portrait of Christ... And then you look at any other president, (laughs) there's just no comparison. In Christ, we have the wonderful king, the perfect king, perfect in all of his ways. What a joy and what a comfort and what an assurance for us that for all of eternity, we will be governed by this perfect king. That's who he is. Unlike Ahaz, Unlike the king of Assyria, unlike the king of Babylon, unlike the kings of Persia, Greece, this king is perfect in all of his ways. Unlike the previous kings of Israel, God is going to send us a king who is faultless in every way, a king we can truly put our hope in. So that's who he is. Do you know him? Have you put your trust in him? Is your hope in this perfect king that Isaiah prophesies? So that's who he is. Secondly, what does the king do? That's who the king is. What does the king do? What does the king do for his people? And he does two things in this passage. Firstly, he restores creation. And secondly, he redeems the nations. Firstly, let's see how this promised king restores creation. Take a look with me at verse 6. The wolf will live with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the goat. The calf and the lion and the yearling together, and a little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear. Their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play near the cobra's den, and the young child will put its hand into the viper's nest. 
This is a remarkable picture, and the, the point it's making is that this king is able to restore creation to the way it was always meant to be. This king is so powerful that he's not just going to conquer a nation here or there. He is going to transform all of creation and bring God's creation project to its ultimate fulfillment. Look at how emphatic the language here. The wolf, verse 6, is not just going to visit the lamb, but is going to live with the lamb. The big bad wolf and the little lamb are going to cohabit together. (laughs) They're going to move in. They're going to live together. So pervasive is this harmony. So complete is this restoration that even the big bad wolf and the little lamb are going to live in the same place, are going to dwell together. And the transformation is fundamental, as you would have seen by the herbivoral nature of some of these animals. The wolf, the bear, the lion are now no longer eating these other animals. They're eating straw together. They're feeding together. There's been a fundamental transformation in their nature because there is no death in this new creation. There is no death in this new world that this king is going to inaugurate. Notice how radical and profound this harmony is. It's the way the world was always meant to be. It's the goal of creation. And it involves a fundamental transformation, even in the nature of creation. That is how powerful this king is. Notice as well that The goal of creation is seen in how humanity rules creation. In this poem, we're told that even a little child will lead these animals. Even a little infant will be able to play with these previously dangerous snakes. And of course, if you remember Genesis 1 and 2, the idea was that Adam and Eve would rule creation. Not in a harsh way, but in a a way that tended for creation, in a way that cared for creation and managed creation and cultivated creation to bring out all of the latent potential in creation. Well, here we have creation so restored, so fulfilled, that even a child can do it. Now, we mustn't press the details too far. You know, sometimes people will read a passage like this and they'll think, am I going to be a little child (laughs) for all of eternity? That's not the point. The point is that creation will be so wonderfully restored. It will be so completely fulfilled in terms of its goal that even a child will be able to manage it. Even a child will be able to care for these animals and not be at risk. And of course, this prophecy is so powerful because it is so far from our experience. You see, at the moment, creation is not in this harmonious Um, experience. Creation is broken. We just have to see um, what's happening to our environment to realize the degradation and decay that characterize the world. And it's not just kind of the environment that falls apart, it's our relationship with the environment, and particularly here, our relationship with animals. Uh, There's a tragic story a couple of years ago, you may have remembered it, of Harambi the gorilla. Uh, Harambi was a 17-year-old gorilla in Cincinnati Zoo, Uh, just a a, a wonderful um, gorilla beloved by um, the managers and keepers of the zoo. But on the 28th of May in 2016, tragically, a young child fell into the gorilla enclosure where Harambi was. And Harambi um, dragged this child around. It wasn't seeming to be overly dangerous, but absolutely terrifying sight. Uh, for the mother and all of the onlookers. And in the end, the manager of the zoo decided they had to actually kill Harambi to save the child and put a bullet into Harambi's head. Of course, you can imagine there was a huge uh, discussion and controversy about this whole event. In the end, um, a number of primatologists and conservationists agreed that the zoo had no other choice. Um, But it's a tragic story a sad story that shows us that actually what Isaiah is talking about here is not our current experience. 
We don't live in a world where infants can play with gorillas uh, or where you can, uh, a, a lamb and a wolf can live together or that a, a baby can play with a cobra. That's just not the world we live in. We live in a world that is broken. We live in a world of decay. We live in a world that is not the way it was designed to be. Our daily reality is one of brokenness, one of frustration, one of decay. And the Bible says that it is the way that is because of God's judgment on sin. When God judged sin, he didn't just judge humanity. He judged, in a sense, all of creation and put all of creation under a curse. Of course, the famous passage that explains this is in Romans chapter 8. And Bible scholar N.T. Wright has translated a section of Romans 8 in a particularly vivid and helpful way. And I want to read it for you. This is how N.T. Wright puts Romans 8. He says, Creation itself is on tiptoe with expectation, eagerly awaiting the moment when God's children will be revealed. Creation, you see, was subjected to pointless futility, not of its own volition, but because of the one who placed it in this subjection, in the hope that creation itself would be freed from its slavery to decay, to enjoy the freedom that comes when God's children are glorified. At the moment, creation itself is in slavery to decay. One day it will be set free, and that's the day that Isaiah is talking about. And the person who's going to do it is this king. This king will, be, will bring God's creation to its fulfillment. This poem expresses something of how God created the world to work. And this, by the way, is how the Bible envisages our future existence with God. When we tend to think of the afterlife, when we tend to think of heaven, we tend to think of it quite wrongly. We tend to think of a sort of future disembodied existence where you're floating around. If you do have a body, you're floating on a cloud and playing a harp, and that's, that's about it. That's really not how the Bible envisages our future life with God. Rather, the Bible pictures a fully physical and spiritual existence, a completely integrated experience in what it calls the new heavens and the new earth, where we will live with God, where God's creation purposes are fully and finally fulfilled. Now, it's worth just thinking about this for a little bit because it can clarify what we imagine this new world with God to be like. When the Bible talks about heaven and earth, most of the time it talks about these two places as separate. Heaven, it tends to describe as God's place, and the earth is human's place. But in the beginning, it was not like that, right? In the beginning, when you think of Genesis 1 and 2, when you think of the Garden of Eden, heaven's place where God lived was also earth's place where people lived because God lived in the garden with Adam and Eve. You see, the Garden of Eden was an integrated place where God lived with humanity and creation was perfect, and when sin entered the world, that was ruptured, and heaven and earth were, you like, were, if you like, separated. God could no longer live with people because a holy God could not live with a sinful people. But ever since that rupture in Genesis 2, God has had a plan to restore heaven and earth again, to integrate heaven and earth again. And the place he did that in the Old Testament was the temple, because, of course, the temple was the place on earth where God did live. It was, if you like, the place where heaven was on earth, where God could actually coexist with his people. And that's why in the temple imagery, if you read the accounts of how the temple was to be built and decorated, there was all this garden kind of imagery because the temple was meant to remind you of the garden. The temple on God's holy hill in Jerusalem was to be a foreshadowing of what a restored heaven and earth would look like a holy place where God could once again live with his people. And if you take a look at verse 9 in Isaiah 11, when God talks about my holy mountain, we see that he actually means the whole new earth, right? They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth, which is his holy mountain, will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. You see, one day, it's not just a small piece of land where the temple was that will constitute the new earth, but it will be all of creation. 
and we will live with God in a renewed garden, in a garden city where there is no death, where there is no decay, where there is no futility, where there is no danger, and we will live with God for all of eternity in that place. The new heavens and the new earth is a restored creation where we will live in harmony with God and with nature for all eternity. This is the king that God is going to send, the king who can accomplish this, the king who is so powerful that he can restore creation. And so God is saying to, to, uh, to his people, why fear the king of Aram? Why fear the king of Ephraim? Why fear the king of Assyria? Look at this king. Look at this king who I'm going to send you, who is powerful enough to restore creation itself. Finally, the last thing this king does is not just restore creation, but he redeems the nations. Take a look with me at verse 10. In that day, the root of Jesse will stand as a banner for the peoples. The nations will rally to him and his resting place will be glorious. In that day, the Lord will reach out his hand a second time to reclaim the surviving remnant of his people from Assyria, from Lower Egypt, from Upper Egypt, from Cush, from Elam, from Babylonia, from Hamath, and from the islands of the Mediterranean. The first nations mentioned here are the superpowers, Assyria and Egypt. These are the big powers of the day. Uh, the point is that no worldly strength can possibly stop God from gathering his people in. No matter how strong you are, you can't stop God from bringing you back. And then, of course, all these other nations, south and north, east and west, can, uh, will be brought in. And the point that God is making is no matter how strong the opposition no matter how far the distance, God can bring me home. God can redeem me and bring me back to himself. And God's king is going to do that. It doesn't matter how strong the opposition is. It doesn't matter how far his people are from him. He is going to get them. He is going to bring them home. Indeed, he is going to be, as it were, a banner for the nations, a signal for the nations, a sign that he is where the nations are to gather Verse 12, he will raise a banner for the nations and gather the exiles of Israel. He will assemble the scattered people of Judah from the four quarters of the earth. No matter where his people have gone, no matter where they have been scattered, he will assemble them together again. In that line, we have one of the great themes of the Bible. What does God do in judgment? God, in judgment, scatters his people. He scatters Adam and Eve from the garden. He scatters the proud um, builders of the Tower of Babel in judgment. He scatters his people in exile. But one day, God will gather them again. God will re reunite them again. And in a foretaste, we see that on the day of Pentecost. We see that through the work of the Holy Spirit, there is kind of a, a growing unity again in the people of God and a gathering and assembling of the people of God. But of course, there's a final fulfillment of this, when God will gather all of his people back to himself. And they will be united. Uh, verse 13, uh, there'll be no longer any jealousy between the northern and southern tribes of Israel. There'll be one people. And verse 14, they will become ambassadors of this king to surrounding nations. They will sub subdue these nations, not through force, but through his message of grace as they come to believe uh, his truth and yoke themselves to his teaching. God's people will become his ambassadors to the nations. But the point here isn't simply that this king can gather the nations, although of course he can. The point is that he redeems the nations in language that reminds us of the Exodus, this king is able to perform a second Exodus, an even greater Exodus. Take a look at verse 11 again. In that day, the Lord will reach out his hand a second time. What do you mean a second time? Well, later on in verse 16, we see that this uh, king, uh, verse 15 and 16, will dry up the gulf of the Egyptian sea with a scorching wind. Well, that, that's exactly what happened when God redeemed his people out of Egypt. But he's not just going to redeem them out of Egypt. 
He is going to redeem them out of Babylon because this scorching wind will sweep over the river Euphrates and this massive river will be broken up into seven streams that you can cross over without even getting your feet wet. And it will be as though the highway, which is a, a, a way of access, an easy way of access, there was a highway coming not just out of Egypt, but there will be a highway that comes out of Babylon, the place where God's people will be exiled to. There will be an end to the exile in a new exodus. This is what the king is going to accomplish. And he will be so effective in doing so, this new exodus out of Babylon, that it will be as though there's an open highway where we can get to him. A highway, as you know, is a road that is easy to travel on. Um, it's sometimes a bit of a chaotic place, uh, but the point of a highway is to make traveling easier and quicker and faster. And this king is going to redeem the nations so that there will be a highway to God, easy access to God. And of course, the fulfillment of this is in the Lord Jesus Christ, who comes to perform a new exodus, not by setting us free from physical slavery from Egypt or Babylon, but by setting us free from spiritual slavery to sin and death. You see, what's humanity's greatest problem? What's the reason that heaven and earth were separated? It was because of sin. It was because a holy God could not live with a sinful people. And so if this king is going to restore creation, he's got to redeem the nations. He's got to cleanse us. He's got to purify us. He's got to remove our sin from us. And Isaiah will go on to tell us about this king, who is also a servant, a servant who can take away the sin of Israel, and the servant who can take away the sin of all the nations, so that he redeems us, not just from Egypt, but from our sin, so that he cleanses us. And the way he does that, we will find out, is by becoming our substitute by taking our place, by bearing our sin and punishment for us so that we might be forgiven, so that we might be restored. You might remember in the Old Testament, the only way you could have access to God and the only way the temple could really function was with a sacrifice. Blood had to get shed for the temple to be effective. And in the same way, Jesus' blood had to be shed for God to come and dwell with us again. Our sin had to be removed. Our guilt had to be atoned for. And Jesus enables these things to happen by going to the cross for us. That's how he redeems the nations. And that is why, in the end, he can restore all of creation. That is how the king does it, so that we can have access to God, so we can get on that highway and go straight into the presence of God and one day be with him in the new heavens and the new earth. What an incredible king we've got. Not just because of who he is, but because of what he does. He restores us, he redeems us. And so what should we do? Well, the application is in Isaiah chapter 12. I'll just read it briefly. I will praise you, Lord, for although you are angry with me, your anger has turned away. Surely God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. He has become my salvation. Isaiah 12 is the application where we praise this God for all that he's done, for all that he is in sending us this incredible king. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful that despite our sin and our unbelief, Despite our hard-hearted rebellion, you can forgive us, and in Christ you can love us. Thank you that he is the perfect king, filled with your spirits and righteous in all of his ways. Thank you also that he restores creation and redeems the nations, and doesn't just redeem the nations, but redeems us as individuals. We pray that you would help us to put our faith in him afresh. Help us to rejoice in this wonderful king, to trust in him, and to praise him. Amen. Hey, once again, thanks for joining us uh, today. We trust that the word of God has impacted you. 
Stay safe, stay healthy, stay in prayer, stay in faith, and we'll see you next yeah, time. Have a great week, everyone. Bye.